Mm-hmm. So embryologically, obviously, exposure to testosterone and DHT have an enormous impact on sexual differentiation um, later in life. I mean, i give you an example. I, I uh, have a patient, female patient, who's on testosterone, and um, she accidentally, for a period of about a month, just didn't read the directions uh, correctly and was taking 10x the dose. And that's not that hard to mess up. It's very you're... easy to do. It's yeah. This is not like uh, uh, this is this is something you have to be very careful with, um, because the doses are so so small. For and there's women. no FDA approved women's testosterone as well. Right. You could have it compounded in theory uh, at a lower concentration. But regardless, she t- she for about a month ended up taking 10x the dose, which means she was taking a male physiologic dose of testosterone. What was her total test? Do you know? We didn't change. even bought it, the symptoms immediately yeah. said there's something going wrong here. Um, but you know, the symptom, the first symptom, interesting that she noted, um, you know, I would have expected hair growth to be the biggest issue, uh, but it was clitoral enlargement hmm. in, within just a period of a month. Yeah. Um, the good news is completely reversible. Once the, the dose was restored to the 10th that it should have been, um, but do you, I, I don't know anything about really, I don't really follow bodybuilding closely enough, but I assume that female bodybuilders are routinely using doses of that nature. Yeah, they are, depending on their guidance, somewhat or very aware of the masculinizing potential of what they're using. And some will avoid testosterone entirely because of that, because it is essentially equal anabolic as it is androgenic. So it begs the question, why would you be using testosterone as a female? If you're trying to achieve super physiologic muscle growth, you kind of know in order to push it to that extent, you're probably going to end up in male characteristic territory. Um, so oftentimes they will defer to compounds like oxandrolone, which is anavar. They'll use things like primabolin sometimes, uh, um, metanolone and so meaning much more anabolic, much yeah. less androgenic. Yeah. So these are synthetic compounds that have been manipulated to be more tissue selective as in more anabolic activity relative to the male viralizing component. Unfortunately, you can't segregate the two entirely, but they do what they can. And the best thing they can do is keep an eye on the side effects as they manifest in very, very real time, keeping a close eye on it. I know some women who even have a, uh, like a decibel voice recorder yep. and they will monitor if their like tone is getting lower or not yep. in real time. Cause in, is that potentially an irreversible, yep. um, change if voice yeah. is changing? Yeah. So you have to be super careful, especially even in TRT, if you were going to do TRT as a female, a lot of the clinics nowadays will advertise and market testosterone in a way that is highlighting how great it is for libido, quality of life, you know, uh, I don't know, glucose management, muscle growth. Like there's a lot of things that sound attractive about it that are an easy sell to a female who, you know, may be asexual and like perimenopause or something. And I've seen standards being promoted as cookie cutter, everyone should have a 200 nanogram per deciliter total test. Wow. Which is crazy. That's very high. Yeah. So my mom and the, actually got on hormone replacement a few years back. And I, at the time, wasn't overseeing, you know, didn't really check what she was doing exactly. I just kind of trusted that the guy who was prescribing, he was very experienced and credentialed and seemed like somebody who I would go to myself to ask for a verification. Is this like a protocol that makes sense? And within just a couple of weeks, pick up the phone and I almost don't even recognize her. I'm like, what? Wow. Mom? (laughs) It's like almost, it's skewing in the direction of male blatantly, but she couldn't really tell because what dose was she on? I don't remember exactly what the dose was because it was like a a cream Mm. and the compounding creams can vary, like you said. So, but whatever it was, it was the one of the practitioners that promotes 200 to 300 total tests in females, which is like insane. Well, it might be worth talking about that for a second. I mean, we'll go back and talk more about TRT, but while we're on the topic, um, as you alluded to earlier, there is no FDA approval for testosterone in the use of women. So there is for men, of course, um, and there's obviously an FDA approval for estrogen and progesterone in the use of women. 
the thinking with testosterone is that when a woman enters perimenopause, not only does she experience the predictable drop in estrogen and progesterone, but with it, so too goes testosterone. Um, and of course, the rationale is that testosterone is still a very important hormone in women. Uh, I've pointed this out many times before, but the units that are used to represent estrogen and testosterone are very misleading because they're not the same. Yeah. So if you convert them to the same units, you will see that even in a woman, her testosterone is significantly higher than her progesterone and estrogen. So uh, if, if you took sort of a mid follicular estrogen level, an estradiol level, and took it out of picograms per deciliter and revert, you know, put everything in nanograms per deciliter, mm -hmm. that her testosterone as a premenopausal woman would be 10, at least 10, and at times even 50 times higher. So yeah. the idea is, well, clearly losing a hormone that's that abundant must have ramifications. There are, you've alluded to all the side effects. And so the thinking is, well, we should replace it. And you know, the question is to what? Now, I've never heard a compelling case for why it should be replaced to a level that exceeds her physiologic limit in her 30s, for example. Yeah. And I've never seen a woman in her 30s with a total testosterone between two and 300 milligram, uh, nanograms per deciliter. In other words, those levels exceed even her peak physiologic level. Yeah. So it doesn't surprise me that that would be androgenizing women. Do you understand or do you have a sense from the folks doing this what their rationale is for going so high? Yeah, I think their idea is simply that this is where we achieve like blatant symptom relief in everyone and a feeling of optimization above and beyond. Like this is what it should feel like when you take hormone replacement. And I think it's just creating a state of you know, like ultimately androgens feel pretty good if you were just crashed or, you know, very low. And then all of a sudden you're essentially on, you know, the male proportional equivalent of like a bodybuilder cycle or something. So yeah, it's, uh, you know, I couldn't say why they do it exactly, but all I know is it's too high and it's very, uh, common to have some of these like viralizing outcomes. And if you're not keeping a close eye on them, they can really, really snowball because when you're seeing yourself in the mirror every day and you're listening to yourself you don't really notice these little minute changes as much as somebody else and then you might meet up with a friend a month later and they're like what the hell you don't even sound the same yeah i mean the other thing that amazes me is there's another symptom that is so common even at physiologic doses for women who are sensitive enough because a lot of times you're treating a woman um and let's say she's 45 and she comes to you and she has almost unmeasurable levels of testosterone. So she's sort of in the 10 to 20 nanogram per deciliter level. Now you didn't know her when she was 30. So you don't actually know what she was when she was 30. Mm -hmm. And you don't know, you know, people weren't measuring her testosterone 15 years earlier. But you say, look, we're going to set a target of 80 to 100 nanograms per deciliter, which is sort of in the ballpark of what would, you know, what would be kind of 70th to 80th percentile for women that age. But then it turns out that she probably was lower than that because once you get her there, her acne is out of control, Yeah. right? And so that you, you would surmise from that that, well, she must have lived at a lower level and for her, 80 is super physiologic. And <clears throat> it's for that reason that I just can't imagine that they're pushing women to 200 and 300 who are not developing horrible cystic acne and you know facial hair and all some sorts of other things. Some of them like how much they feel so much and now I'm having sex multiple times a day, even with my husband who I didn't even want to touch you right, know, right. a couple months ago. So it's a pretty big shift. And if they like what they're getting out of it, sometimes compromises will be made in order to continue with what they think they need to be taking to achieve that feeling. And in addition to that too, like you said, with the not knowing where you were at further confounding that is how many people have been on combined oral contraceptives for like decades. Absolutely. Yeah. Just totally and, skews everything. Yeah. Like I've dated girls who I've seen like 80% suppression of their hormone levels, like testosterone, free testosterone, especially proportionally more so too, because of the rise. And the SHBG, SHBG goes through. Oh, the yeah. It's yeah. ruthless. So they're like, operating in a state of androgen deficiency perpetually and relying on this synthetic progestin to drive all like testosterone like behavior essentially and then if they get off 
they don't even know what their natural is. Like they've never experienced it because they've been prescribed it since, you know, 15 years old or 16 years old or something. Yeah. So it's tough because it's like you don't even know what your ideal target is. Even if you were getting blood work, oftentimes it's totally skewed. And that's something I definitely want to talk about on my podcast, too, is some of the testosterone suppression in different formats of birth control because it's pretty pretty nebulous some of it like i'm very aware of the combined oral contracept contraceptive data but even like the localized progestins and stuff there's like very minimal literature shockingly like if i'm trying to find out how much the morena affects my girlfriend yeah like, i don't even know i don't know what her baseline probably was so yeah, yeah. have you been following at all the the natesto uh product yeah yeah it uh looks good if you're willing to tolerate it yeah, uh, for folks who don't know, Natesto is an intranasal administration of testosterone, and um, I believe the dose is like seven milligrams, and it's used TID, so three times a day, mm -hmm. which tells you that obviously the bioavailability is quite low if you're taking 21 milligrams uh, daily, so that's you know slightly more than you would probably take if you were just doing it intramuscularly, um, but nevertheless... Um, the the idea with it is it's quicker acting mm -hmm. um and that's why you have to take it sort of three times a day because it's not sticking around like in a fat depot the way an injectable uh source would be but um the interesting question is does this help address some of the female use case so for example if one of the symptoms that a female is turning to testosterone for is libido. Does she really need to be on mega doses of systemic testosterone round the clock versus, you know, in the same way a man would use Cialis for an on demand ED issue? Uh -huh. Could a woman be using intranasal testosterone for an on demand libido issue? I would hope that'd be the case. In practical application, I don't know if it plays out that way where you could just acutely use it once a week or something on the day you're, you know, wanting to get busy. Like yeah. I've candidly had some experimentation <laughs> with it and it doesn't seem to make at least that big of a difference. With you or with a female? No, with a female with okay. like low testosterone. I see, I see. So yeah. in other words, you're saying if, if a female would look, because I was going to say in, in a male, I wouldn't expect it to have no, no effect. No, no, it would make no difference yeah, in me. Yeah, yeah, But you're saying in a female with low testosterone, taking a couple of shots of Natesto didn't in the subsequent hours have much of an impact on libido? No, but that's obviously n of one yeah, yeah and i haven't actually seen the data in literature myself and i don't even know if it exists right now i know i'm not does. i'm not aware but i believe there is a clinical trial ongoing okay. I, I, and yeah. I, i'm I, I think it might be happening at baylor but i'm not sure and one thing i can say is as much as it sounds great the <laughs> typically women don't like using it that much so it's like try just because it's messy and yeah, it's like dripping down the back of their throat. It's yeah. like this, you know, very not it's like invasive in a way that's not very clean. You just feel kind of gross. Yeah. You're like a drug addict almost You're like snorting some shit before you go have sex every time. Like it's uh, yeah, interesting. Know. It like but obviously the the not having sex and not having a libido probably a worse outcome for many of them. So if it works in the short term on like a use by use basis. Um, I'm sure it's individual case dependent and I'm sure you could double up the dose and maybe get, you know, more of a, you know, bang for your buck effect. But um, I'm just like skeptical that anyone's gonna use it more for novelty once in a while. And then, I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've never actually seen the product. I don't know what the viscosity is it of it is. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the, what the user experience is like. So um, is yeah. it, is it, is it, particularly viscous or is it kind of like a like a nasal spray that you would use for you know an antihistamine or something you know maybe it's so uh, the one i had experience with was a compounded like replica of that so maybe the natesto uh, formula itself is actually more tolerable so i probably should have prefaced with that but the you know compounded variant that i tried that was replicating that product was not that pleasant and it was like almost like creamy not a spray yeah see i, I yeah I, I think i would i would want to see what the real deal product was like